Thank you for joining us on Straight Up, the podcast for diverse professionals to grow their careers as leaders. And you are going to be in for a real treat today. Our guest is gonna give you a three-step process for building trust. One of the challenges that diverse professionals face is building those trusted relationships so that you can become influential. So you're gonna get a very practical three-step method for that from our next guest. I want to welcome David Casey, Chief Diversity Officer from CVS Health. And you are just a treasure in terms of your knowledge, your wisdom, your experience, and yet practical and really down to earth. It is a joy to have you in our podcast today. Thank you very much, Bonnie. And thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here and be a part of this dialogue today. Thank you. So what do you think people are going to get out of this? How, how would you uh, frame up what you want people to get out of this interview? You know, Bonnie, one of the things I try to strive for and share with people is how to really take all of your life experiences, whether personal or professional, and really, you know, reflect back on them. So many times, you know, we're facing things in our life, either in our personal life or professional life, we're not really sure how we're going to get through it, how we're going to overcome it. But when you really take the time and sit in peace and quiet and reflect back on all the things that you've experienced to this point, the answer of how you get through today is usually there. That's great advice. And we're going to talk about how multicultural, how diverse people get through their careers, how they advance. So advice for them, not just changing the system, but advice for them. But I want to start with something you shared with me uh, a month or so ago about how you made a difference at CVS because you're an African-American male, not just doing your job, but as part of the leadership, being able to speak up and make a difference. Can you share that story? Well, sure, Bonnie. So when, um, the, the, when COVID first out broke, there was a big outbreak. You know, we started seeing data that showed that Blacks and African-Americans and very shortly after data that Hispanics and Latinos and then shortly after Native Americans as well. But we started seeing some of the earliest data around Blacks and African-Americans being significantly impacted uh, disparately by COVID-19, you know, being infected and dying at about three and a half times the rate of white Americans. And when you saw most of the testing protocols being rolled out early uh, in the outbreak, it was all governed by drive-through sites, you know, either big tents or, you know, again, just being able to drive through a facility to get tested. And I started, you know, putting the pieces together. So you have the Black and African-American, Hispanic, Latino communities who are being disparately impacted. Those communities probably have a disparity as it relates to access to a personal vehicle as well. So how are they gonna get tested if they don't have access to a personal vehicle? So I raised that question with some of my colleagues and we in turn raised that question with HHS. And um, it was a logical question. And, and most folks said, you know, that makes sense. So as a result of that, we, we uh, were able to build in the capability for individuals to get tested in what we call community-based testing sites where you can walk into a facility and get tested, uh, a rapid test uh, where it can be done in 30 minutes. Uh, without having the need for a personal vehicle, if that was going to be your barrier to getting access. That just gives me chills. And that's such a great story about, you know, being in the seat for such a time as this. And you mentioned talking to HHS. So did that have implications beyond CVS? I would certainly hope so. You know, um, I hope that now as people think about testing protocols and access issues that you really think about, um, some of these systemic barriers that may impact, may be, may be impacting communities. Um, and I understand, you know, some of the early rationale around drive through testing and that kind of thing, I think, was based around, you know, keeping people safe and uh, making sure we had enough PPE and that kind of thing. But you have to make the connections back to the disparities that communities are really facing and how you can address those disparities. Everything we do should be done through the lens of how are the least of us going to be able to access these solutions. That's great. And 
And I love the point of that story too, is as a leader in your organization, you may be weighing in on things that aren't normally under your purview, you know, and, but you can make a tremendous difference by providing that per perspective as well. Yeah. <laughs> as a chief diversity officer, if you had asked me at the beginning of 2020, if I would have the opportunity to help be a part of a leadership team to roll out community-based COVID-19 testing sites. <laughs> Are you out of your mind? I, I know nothing about COVID testing. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, being willing and, and being able to take that step out there, that leap of faith and stretch yourself beyond your usual swim lanes is something that we have to do. And it's something we're not always comfortable with doing, but no risk, no reward. It's leadership. That's what leadership is, right? So I want to I want to dig into um, talking about telling and selling your value, which is something that comes up a lot with the uh, diverse professionals that we work with, and a lot of people. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, "My work should speak for itself. I shouldn't have to play politics. I shouldn't have to do that." And yet, uh, the reality is, if we're not helping people. To, to see our value, not just to see what you do, and people don't even see everything you do, but to, to see the impact of what you do. If we're not helping people to, to translate that, those stories don't always get told. What do you see as some of the differences or what advice would you give for diverse professionals in terms of how do you help others to tell and sell your value? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a matter of not looking at it as coming across as, you know, so many times we're kind of taught you know, don't brag about your work. And, and we're taught to be deferential to power structures. And that's just kind of some of the cultural nuances that are built into who we are. And sometimes we actually do get punished for speaking. Oh, up, absolutely. Right? So it's not just absolutely. all in our heads, right? <laughs> no, that, that's exactly right. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think one, one thing that I would encourage people to be comfortable with is the understanding that no one can advocate or will advocate for you better than you. And, you know, it's not a matter of bragging or, or being boastful about what you've accomplished. But look, in today's work environment, you know, especially in large companies, it's not even just a matter of people being unwilling to acknowledge your work. To your point earlier, Bonnie, people may just not even see it. We're all moving at a, you know, a rapid pace and things are moving so quickly. And it's not that people don't necessarily want to recognize your work. It just may go by in such a, a flash Oh, I, oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't remember that you did that. You know, so I would say make sure you document your successes. That's the other, don't, don't assume that people know. And just always know that no one, right, wrong, or indifferent, they may have the best of intentions, but no one can advocate for you better than you can. Especially in this virtual world, right? We're not even Absolutely. all in the, in the same place. So uh, you, you, you really want to help people. Did you ever make mistakes with that early on in your career? Yeah. Did you have some, some learning points? Absolutely. And I think one of my biggest learnings was exactly what you said. That's assuming that meritocracy in corporate America in and of itself is going to win the day. And meritocracy in corporate America in and of itself does not win the day. So some of my early learnings were you need to build relationships. You need to invest in relationships. You need to bring other people along with you uh, who not only will recognize your successes, but will partner with you in those successes and will be willing to advocate for you in that regard as well. And I think, uh, you know, yes, one of my biggest learnings earlier in my career was believing that meritocracy in and of itself would carry my career forward without any need for me to intervene and actually advocate on my behalf. I wish I had known that earlier in life. And, you know, many majority professionals um, understand that they learn that early on in life. But many of us, you know, women and people of color, many of us don't learn that. Yeah, I didn't grow up in a family where people worked in corporate America. My mother was a school teacher, you know, which is not unique for, for Black people. Uh, and so I didn't learn how to navigate a big corporation, whereas other people might have gone to the country club when they were growing up and, and you know, heard those stories at the dinner table. That's not my experience. not yours either, right? That's a great point. Yeah, my father uh, never uh, progressed past high school. My mom had some vocational school training after high school, but not much. And I didn't have a lot of folks to around me to advise and coach and counsel me on how to navigate corporate America by any stretch. So uh, if you grow up in it, it's, some of this is about how wealthy your family was or were they involved in corporate America or nonprofits? You know, there's, there's all kinds of variables here. 
but uh, but you were saying you had to learn some hard lessons about not assuming everything would work if you worked hard. And and I don't think I don't think other successful people work that way either. We just need to learn the lessons and be very proactive about building those relationships too. Yeah. Speaking of which, um, sponsorship. So you talked about really getting other people to advocate for you. So we need to talk to be able to tell and sell our value, but we also need to enlist other people to amplify our voice, right? And so we call that sponsorship, people who go to bat for you, especially when you're not in the room. So not just coaching you when you're in the room, but they're talking about you when you're not there. And, uh, and that's a power of any, any special advice for women or minorities for uh, enlisting people to advocate for you. Sponsorship is absolutely key. It is absolutely necessary. I think for so many years, for decades, and we were rightfully focused on mentorship. And, you know, once again, like meritocracy, we thought mentorship would carry the day. You know, mentorship is important. I think you, it can help you increase your knowledge base. It can help you build relationships, but you really need to have those who are part of the power base of your organization speaking on your behalf. You have to understand where that power base lies in your organization. Now, sponsorship I think this is just my opinion and my view. I think sponsorship more times than not is a natural uh, evolution from a mentoring relationship. You know, um, I think yes, people get to know you, they get to know what you're about. Um, you know, you get to know what they're about. They get, they're a lot more comfortable speaking on your behalf. I think it gets to be a little bit more difficult if you just run up to somebody out of the blue and say, hey, go talk about me with, with so-and-so. And, and I, that's very difficult for me to do as a professional. I have a lot of people who want me to advocate for them on their behalf, and I want to, but, uh, you know, I, you know, time out, let's take a step back and I have to get to know you first, because before I invest some of my, you know, relationship capital in advocating for you. So I would say, you know, it, it's very difficult to leapfrog to sponsorship without having that mentorship relationship uh, first. Uh, I think it can be done, but I think it's more effective if you really invest the time up front to really get that individual comfortable advocating for you before you make that ask. But you can still be intentional, right? Because what somebody could take away from what you just said is that unless you naturally build that relationship, you're not gonna be able to capitalize on it. But you can be intentional about setting up a meeting with somebody who could be a sponsor and finding a project or, you know, even if it's a small project you can do for them so that they get to see your work. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, the other way you can have someone kind of, you know, serve in that sponsor role is to ask him a very simple question. Who don't I know in the organization that I should know? And can you help make the introduction? That's so, a great know, point. I love that. Can, yeah. can, can, can elaborate on that. Yeah, you know, even if they don't really know everything about you or, you know, what your business acumen is or your project management skills, if they don't know all of the technical details of your background, if they know you well enough that they're at least willing to make the introduction, that's also a form of sponsorship. Right, because it's an endorsement. When they introduce you to so-and-so, they say, hey, I really want you to meet David. He's a great guy and here's what he's accomplished, you know. So it's, it's an endorsement when they open a door for you. And that can speed up that process of, somebody getting ready to endorse you because they they take the opinion of the person who introduced you so yeah that that's a great way to to shorten the the timeline to get to that sponsorship effect no, so you think about the power of the amplification uh or the you know, you know the uh the, the power of uh, magnifying your impact if you ask that simple question every time you come across a a, a new relationship in your organization or you meet a new leader uh, before you walk away from that conversation, ask them the simple question. You know, here's what I'm trying to do with my career. Can you let me know who in the company I should know that I don't know? And would you be willing to make the introduction? I think, you know, think about the power of that. If you if you ask that question of everyone in your organization that you encounter. That's a great question. And, you know, it's interesting. Another mistake I think that diverse uh, leaders often make is not aiming high enough for yeah. the relationship for a sponsor. Yeah. Uh, and you're nodding ferociously. Go ahead and, and elaborate on that. Yeah, I, I run across that all the time. You know, I, I'll never forget, I was speaking to the CFO of an organization and uh, he, a white male CFO had been in that role for, you know, uh, quite a while, was very accomplished. And um, 
you know, he even told me, he said, I would love to mentor and sponsor people, but no one ever approaches me. And that's, you know, I gave him some tips on how he could proactively, you know, reach out to people as well. But he said, David, I absolutely love that because it actually gives me a break from the rigors of my day job. And I love investing in people and I love helping to develop people. This was the CFO for a Fortune 50 company. He was looking for opportunities to spend time with folks. These are normal people. You can appreciate and respect someone's professional accomplishments, but they get up and breathe air just like we do every day. These are people and you have to look at them as such and not be overly intimidated by, by their title or what their role is in, in, organ, in an organization. I wish I had a dollar for every time I gave someone that advice to approach someone they thought was unapproachable and they were met with a very warm, welcoming response and they were just flabbergasted and blown away by it. They didn't expect that at all. Another reason why I think people sometimes don't reach high enough is because they don't look like you when you retire, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly right. And that can be a little uncomfortable. You know, that's another lesson, Bonnie, I wish I had learned earlier in my life. I was a little, I was not as comfortable in my skin as a African-American professional to really bring that to the table in my relationship with mentors and sponsors and even just coworkers. You know, I was very uncomfortable with being the Black guy or, you know, representing the African-American perspective and and while I can't represent the entire African-American perspective because we're a very uh, diverse diaspora, but um, what I can do is bring my perspectives to the table, my experience to the table. Like I shared earlier with the uh, COVID testing perspective, I, I thought about that because I, I had visions of my neighborhood growing up where pe a lot of people did not have their own personal vehicles. So I kind of saw their faces in my mind and I, I started thinking, Wow, how would Miss Jones get to get a test if, if she could only go through a drive through right? So I, I think, you know, if people can get comfortable bringing that part of who they are to the workplace and these relationships, look, there are a lot of white men, white women, Hispanic, whatever the case may be, there are a lot of folks who want to learn and understand that perspective. So, you know, that, that relationship is not just about what they can provide to you. It's also about what you can educate them on. It's definitely a two-way street, and it should be, is to, to look for ways that you can be helpful to that person, is to provide a different perspective or provide input, or sometimes even uh, just do something small that you can do for them that is helpful. So, but yeah, trying to make it a two-way street is, is definitely a good way to go. But so we, we've talked about looking for sponsors who may not look like you uh, and reaching high enough. And, uh, and, and taking the initiative too. And it's interesting, I was looking at uh, books by leadership experts who are diverse, and I came across one book that was written by a Hispanic male leader and another one by a black male leader. And they both said, you approach mentors, but sponsors really approach you. If somebody's gonna go to bat for you, they're gonna, they're gonna go, you can't ask them to do that. They, they do that for you. And then I was looking at a book by a, a black woman leader on Wall Street. And she said, you know, for women that often doesn't work. If you're waiting for sponsors to show up and raise their hand and say, I wanna sponsor you, you may not get that, as, especially as a multicultural woman. That it, and it's not uh, bad, you know, it's not that people are, are, are mean, it's just that it, it may not naturally happen as easily because you got the double difference. So uh, and Andrew, do you have thoughts on that about, can you approach people and ask them to go to bat for you for, for a promotion or an introduction? Yeah, absolutely you can. And I think you should, you know, uh, to your point, Bonnie, it's not always a matter of somebody being racist or sexist and that's why they're not sponsoring you. It's people's natural tendency. It's our natural comfort zone to surround ourselves and be around people who are most like us. And, you know, unless we have someone kind of challenging that, 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 that framework or that frame of mind, it'll never, it'll never change. It'll never be any different. So absolutely, I think you should approach people and ask them to, uh, to sponsor, you know, you need to bring something to the table. You know, there, there's some accountability we all have to have as well. You can't just expect someone to sponsor you if you're not bringing anything to the table, if you're not demonstrating to them and articulating to them what you are trying to do for yourself in your career and where you need their help. 
if you're expecting someone to navigate and manage your entire career for you, that's the wrong way to go about it. I agree. Specificity can be helpful too. Like I, I right. often say to people, don't make an appointment with somebody and say, will you be my sponsor? You know, it's like, will you be my daddy? You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it, it, if you can ask for something specific, like I'm thinking about applying for this role, would you be able to put in a good word for me? Or, or can you give some other examples of asking people for specific things, not just, Hey, you know, run my life. <laughs> yeah. No, that's exactly right. The more specific you can be, the better off, you know, because if someone just approaches me and says, Hey, can you sponsor me? Okay. What does that mean? Who, who should I introduce you to? Uh, you know, what, what, what experiences can I make sure you get plugged into? So I think, yeah, the more specific you, and that also demonstrates to that sponsor that you're investing in your, in your own career. And right? you've thought about it. You've thought about what, you know, what am I trying to do? Not just, Hey, help me be successful. <laughs> okay. So right. It's just too much to ask. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so you're thinking strategically, you're building the relationship. I always right. too, talk to you about open-ended questions. So if you're saying, you know, Hey, I, I'm interested in this role, you know, could you go to bat for me? And, and then they might say no, but, but, you know, maybe a different role would be better for you. You know, they, they can, they can give you advice. You don't have to be, you want to be specific, but not uh, narrow-minded. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely don't want to pigeonhole yourself. And I'll tell you what, what companies, especially large companies, what companies really appreciate these days, I think we've all heard the term in the past, corporate athletes. Companies appreciate individuals who can flex, people who can look across the enterprise and understand where they might be able to add value. I challenge my team with that all the time. I, I tell them all the time, please lift your head up and look around the organization to see where you can add value that may not be written in your job description. You know, hey, I volunteer for this not-for-profit and we experience something related to what the company's trying to solve for. It's not in my job description, but let me bring that to the table to see if I can add value. You know, what's interesting is we've looked at a lot of the challenges for women and for minorities, but uh, I keep seeing that picture of you as a Marine and thinking about veterans have some unique challenges, even uh, that, that when you transfer into the corporate world, people may not always understand all your leadership experience. It may not be, you know, immediately transferable. Um, I also have a disability. And so we look at people with disabilities rising into leadership too. Uh, any, any thoughts on some of these other areas that don't get talked about as much? Yeah, you know, um, I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier, Bonnie, and, and really being willing and able to advocate for yourself. I remember having a conversation with a young soldier. Uh, he was an officer in the army and he was getting ready to separate and he was a combat engineer. And uh, we were at a job fair and I said, what would you like to do for CVS Health? And he said, I can do anything. And I said, you know, if a recruiter hears you say that, what that recruiter is gonna hear you say is that you really can't do anything. If you just put yourself out there that I can do anything, that's not truly true. So I said, stop and think about, you know, what do you do? And he started talking about, you know, I blow stuff up and <laughs> I clear out <laughs> uh, uh, lanes for our vehicles to drive through. And I said, you know what? We don't really have a need for people who blow things up at CVS, but what we do have a need for are individuals who can work under pressure, individuals who can work with little supervision, individuals who have to think innovatively and creatively on the fly, in the moment. That's motivated, motivated team. Yeah, absolutely. So think about those transferable skills and, and, you know, again, I can't say it enough, Bonnie, and I hope I don't sound like a broken record, but you have to be willing to advocate for yourself and, and really market yourself and, and, and be confident in that. Because, you know, again, if you're not confident, if you're not willing to advocate for yourself, who else is going to do it for you? And studies show that a lot of diverse people don't always get honest feedback either. Like the feed that yeah. what you just described is you gave somebody some really important, honest feedback that a lot of people might not have, they would have said, oh, I just glossed over it. Um, what can diverse individuals do to create the conditions to get that honest feedback? I think, you know, this is going to sound kind of the cart before the horse kind of thing, but I think letting people know up front that you need that. Not, not only that you want it, but you need that feedback. I tell people all the time, please, please, please tell me how I can get better. You're not doing me any favors by not telling me how I can get better. So I think letting folks know that you not only appreciate it, but you want and need it kind of gives them a sense of you open the door, you know, uh, before I'm ready to give somebody feedback. 
I usually ask them the question, are you open to some feedback right now? If they say no, then I don't give them that feedback. But I, th I think letting people know that, that that door is open and that you not only appreciate it, but you actually want it. If you can articulate that up front, I think that makes a big difference. And what happens when you get feedback that you really don't agree with or you don't think is fair? You know, depending on who it's coming from, you know, if it's coming from your boss and your boss has direct control over your career, you don't think it's fair. I think, again, you have to speak up. What, what, what's, you have to think about the, uh, the pros and cons of, of not speaking up. How is it going to help you if you don't speak up? And at least, you know, at the end of the day, you may agree to disagree. There's not much you can do about that. But if you don't speak up, then no one's ever going to know. So I think, you know, you, you again, if somebody who doesn't know you that well gives you some feedback that you don't agree with or you think is off base, eh, put it in the context for what it's worth. They don't really know me. I appreciate the feedback, but they're off base and you move on. But if it's someone that has direct influence over your career trajectory, you need to take that opportunity and say, I disagree. And here's why. Come with receipts, as they say, as the kids say. Don't just, don't just say I disagree, but come with receipts. I love that. And uh, Carla Harris often says, perception is the co-pilot of reality, right? So if people are giving you feedback that isn't right, that could still be valuable because they may not be the only person thinking that. And so, you know, you might want to think about how can I, if that's the perception of me, uh, maybe I need to deal with that in a, in a broader way. Yeah. I, I would also caution too that uh, we're saying, you know, minorities and, and women and diverse folks don't always get honest feedback because people, you know, don't feel comfortable or they're worried about a lawsuit even, you know, so creating those conditions to get the honest feedback is important. So then when they give it to you, if you go, oh, I don't agree with it, you know, you might uh, stop any further feedback. So, so how do you choose your moment so that you, you can, as you say, address something that's not right, but not chill the, the relate, you know, the, she don't get any more feedback. Yeah. That's where investing in relationships comes into play. You know, if you build that sense of trust with an individual trust goes two ways, you know, and I've always invested in a three tier approach to building trust. First, I'm going to tell you why you should trust me. Uh, then next, I'm going to show you why you should trust me by being consistent and doing what I said I was going to do. And third, I'm going to I'm going to advocate for you on your behalf. So if you can do things, uh, if you can put that, you know, build that that trust factor and uh, and and again, give them that that open door. I think that goes a long way. But you have to build a sense of trust. And, um, you know, because and, and we we being blacks and African-Americans in particular struggle with that. Because you don't want to have people think that, you know, you're the stereotypical angry black person, you know, oh, they're just, you know, they're just, they're just feeling it right now. So that's why they're pushing back. No, it's not about that. I need to speak my truth as I see it. I appreciate your feedback, but I also need to speak my truth. And it's not coming from me just being the angry black person, but how you get there is you have to build that rapport and build that sense of trust with the individual you're having this narrative with. It's very difficult to do with people you have no relationship with. So let me uh, check my understanding of what you said is, is in the moment, you know, if it's a newer relationship and you're just starting to get feedback, you might want to just accept it and sort of give a, give a critique of it later, like not do it in the same moment. Um, and if you're investing in that trust building, if you've built up a lot of that already, then it's easier to respond in the moment yeah. and say, you know, hey, here's my receipts about why I disagree with that. And, you know, can we let, let's talk about this, because I really want to know if that's a real thing, you know, so there's there's ways to 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 make it more granular. But these are the kind of things that I think folks get stuck on. Right. Is is yeah, how right. to get that feedback and keep it coming and keep building that trust. Yeah. Bonnie, you, you raised a good point earlier as well. One of the things you can do with that feedback as well is pressure test it with other people. You know, hey, I got this feedback from so-and-so. You know, I think it's because they don't know me that well, but what do you think? You know, and, and who else could I, could I get the, a perspective from to see if maybe that feedback is valid? Maybe it's not. So I think taking the time to back away and kind of ruminate on it for a little bit and maybe pressure test it with a few other people is always a good idea as well. That's great. What is the best advice you ever got in your career? Uh, be accountable and be responsible for your own career. Never sit back and, and, and trust your career. Uh, never put the, the, the faith and trust to someone else uh, in your career. 
Um, and, and I, you know, that's something I've always tried to do. I remember early on in my career, I had gotten a new boss um, of the company I worked for. Our office got a new boss and I wasn't very confident in this individual's abilities. And I was still fairly early in my career, didn't have a lot of professional experience, but I, even in that moment, I said, look, I don't think this is going to end well because <laughs> this individual doesn't really know what they're doing. I don't think that, you know, we're going to continue to have the kind of success that we've been having. I moved on. You know, it was a big risk for me. I was early in my career, but I said, I'm not going to trust and, and put my career future in the hands of this individual that I don't think is going to um, go in the direction I think I need my career to go. So I think, you know, part of the earliest advice I got that that's really served me well over the years is never trust your career to anyone to anyone else but you, but yourself. And you can get people to help you, but you need to always uh, be the CEO, right? Of Absolutely. Yeah. And, and speaking of CEO, Bonnie, have a board of directors, have a personal board of directors. I know we talk about that a lot over the years, but you really need to have a handful of people uh, that you can constantly bounce things off of and people who will hold you accountable because career tra trajectories don't always go like this. Sometimes they go like that. And maybe sometimes when you're in a rut, you may want to get stuck in a pity party. And it's nice to have people around you who can kind of kick you in the rear end and get you out of that funk. So uh, I would say another great piece of uh, advice, career advice related to that is uh, really, uh, you know, make sure you have your own personal board of directors. I am so glad you said that because that is one thing that frustrates me too is, you know, and I've listened to thousands of people talking about their careers and the leadership programs that I run. And, and so often I hear people say, how do I find that one sponsor who's going to push everything forward in my career? <laughs> it's like, no, you really need a board of directors. You know, you need a group of people and, and not all your moves are going to be straight up. And, it, and it's not a problem. Sometimes you got to move laterally to get the breath of knowledge across the company so that you can right. be influential. So, so yeah, you really need a board of directors. You really need to be recruiting various stakeholders in your career that, that can make a difference in small ways and big ways, but it, it accumulates. So yeah. yeah. So many powerful, practical pieces of advice. I, I really appreciate what you're bringing to the table here and uh, keeping it real, keeping it honest, keeping it practical. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy, busy day at CVS Health, saving the world <laughs> for us. We're counting on you. And uh, just so much appreciate the work you're doing at such a time as this. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me, Bonnie. And the feeling is quite mutual. Thank you for everything that you do to continue to build today's leaders and tomorrow's leaders. I appreciate it.